I'm going to do something a little bit different when I talk about the manuscripts for Romanesque art. I've chosen two manuscripts which have female art patrons and presumably were painted uh, by the sisters, by the nuns in the scriptorium where these uh, women were the abbesses. And the, uh, the two abbesses we're going to talk about probably had a great deal of input into uh, not only the text, which is their work, but also into the pictures. The first one I'm going to talk about is Hildegard of Bingham. Now, she is considered to be a saint of the Catholic Church. Um, she was German. Uh, she was born in 1098 and died in 1179. So you can see that, uh, particularly for the Middle Ages, uh, she would have lived uh, to be a very old lady. Um, she is a visionary nun and an abbess. Uh, she's sometimes called the Sibyl of the Rhine and has long been venerated as a saint. Now, uh, Pope Benedict XVI uh, reaffirmed her sanctity. He declared her a saint. Her feast day is the day of her death, uh, which is the normal thing you do for saints, um, September 17th. Uh, it's the day when they go to heaven. So it's their birthday into uh, heaven, essentially, is the day of their death. Uh, so September 17th is St. Hildegard's uh, day. And she has a very unique position for a woman. Um, she was declared a doctor of the church on October 7th, 2012. Uh, she's one of only four women who are considered to be a doctor of the church. And what that means is that the church has recognized their writings as um, authoritative, um, that they are what, free of heresy, uh, that they are to be believed. The other thing where she is absolutely unique is that she is the only woman to have a volume in Patrologius Cursus Completus. Now, what is Patrologius Cursus Completus? Uh, it is the complete writings of the fathers of the church. It's hundreds of volumes, and it's divided into two series, the Latin series, Patrologia Latina, and the Greek series, Patrologia Graeca. Um, these were published, uh, for the most part, in the late 19th century, and Hildegard of Bingham is the only woman to have a complete volume of her writings in Patrologia's Cursus Completus uh, Latina, in the Latin or the Western Fathers of the Church. So I guess you could say they've got a mother of the church as well as a father of the church uh, in Patrologia's Cursus Completus. Her volume is number 197. Now, what did she write? Well, we said she was a visionary nun. So she wrote or had her visions written down. But she was a very accomplished woman. Um, she wrote music and lyrics, including a musical play. And she wrote the oldest known morality play called the Ordo Virtuum the order of virtue. She is the first musical composer whose biography is known. And she also wrote books on the natural world and on medicine. Now, what we're going to be looking at is a volume uh, known today as Givius. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, that records her visions and was illustrated. Unfortunately, the manuscript vanished during World War II.
And what we have, we don't know whether the manuscript was destroyed or whether it was stolen and has not been found. Um, but what we have, there are some black and white photographs that were taken of some pages. But there was a colored copy, which seems to be a very close copy, perhaps almost a facsimile, uh, that was created between 1927 and 33, And that is what the colored pictures that you'll be seeing uh, were taken from was this uh, facsimile edition that was created by, uh, by nuns. Um, the date of the manuscript, you find uh, slightly different dates in different places. Sometimes you see uh, 1165, some uh, 1170 to 75. The book itself probably dates from 1142 and plus. Okay, a little bit about her life. At age eight, she was given to the anchoress Juta, J-U-T-T-A. Now, an anchoress is like a hermit. Only instead of going out into the instead of going out into the wilderness, an anchoress is confined to a cell that's usually attached to a church or a monastery or abbey. Uh, in this case, uh, it's attached to uh, a monastery of Dies Bodenberg. And she literally was walled up into this room or cell with you know a little opening uh, for a little window where food could be passed in, waste could be passed out, people could come and talk to her. Uh, and this was the woman to whom Hildegard was given to raise and to train. Uh, so she's been essentially uh, her family's gift to the church. Well, other nuns joined them. Uh, when Juta dies in 1136, Hildegard becomes the abbess. And then she goes off and starts a new convent at Bigham. And that was around 1150. Now, she had had visions since she was a child, maybe about five years old. But the visions that become this volume, uh, known as Givius, um, date from about 11, uh, 1141. Now, the word skivius uh, is actually uh, two words mashed together. Uh, skivius domini are the first words of the volume. And it means know the ways of the Lord. Domini is Lord, vius is the ways. Ski, ski <laughs> uh, would be the word for know. So know the ways of the Lord is how it begins. And they just used as the title, uh, the first two words sort of uh, pushed together. So, Scivius, Scivius Domini. Um, as we said, uh, Hildegard started a new convent. She started several new convents. Uh, the first one was at Rupertsburg around uh, 1150. And then she founded another convent at Bingham around 1165. She continued to have these visions, but at first she didn't write them down. And it wasn't until about 1141 she had the visions that became uh, the volume we call the Scivius. And she says that the heavens were opened and the blinding light of exceptional brilliance flowed through my entire brain. And suddenly I understood the meanings of the Bible. And she also received what she believed was a command from God that she should write down her visions. In 
And so here you see um, the facsimile of a page from Scivius. And you can see uh, the picture that, we've, that we'll be looking at more closely in the picture you've already seen uh, that shows you Hildegard receiving divine inspiration and uh, dictating uh, her, uh, her visions uh, to the monk who uh, eventually, uh, of course, would have uh, presented this um, to be approved. Now, we said that probably the illustrations were done by the nuns at her convent under her direction and design, and there is some reason to think so. We'll talk about that. One of the reasons is because some of it has very original iconography uh, and compositions, and they seem to relate quite directly um, to some of the things that we'll, we'll talk about uh, with Hildegard. Uh, in other cases, you have traditional motifs, but sometimes they simply seem transformed and very different, as though they're not uh, just copying some uh, other image. So first we're going to look at this image of Hildegard. Uh, this is a 12th century manuscript. Uh, people you know, have different dates for it, anywhere from 1150 to uh, 1175, so sort of in the middle, uh, 1165 perhaps. And we're seeing uh, Hildegard showing, receiving divine inspiration. She's seated. She has her feet up on a little footstool. Uh, she's holding a tablet, which is uh, believed to be a wax tablet. And some people have suggested that she's actually doing uh, some sketches uh, to, to show what her vision was like. Uh, you'll see that she's in a little architectural structure here. Uh, and coming down from what it looks like from the ceiling are these fiery tongues, which relate to the Holy Spirit. She is receiving the Spirit of God. And uh, so these are coming down uh, to her and inspiring her. Now, you'll also notice that she's separate from her confessor, Volmar. Uh, he's on the other side of a wall. He can stick his head through, as you can see, uh, but not his whole body because she is an encloistered nun. So he's out there writing down what she tells him. Uh, and she dictates her vision to him. Now, one of the reasons uh, that we think that Hildegard must have had some input into the illustrations is because her visions are so clearly represented. And also because it has been suggested, um, and uh, Madeleine Cavanis is the person who has argued, and I think argued convincingly, uh, that Hildegard designed or directed the creation of the illuminations done by nuns at her convent. She points to the originality of the compositions. Uh, but there's also another factor. One of the things that's believed is that her visions contain characteristics of migraine headaches. And so uh, many people have suggested that her visions are, um, are migraine headaches that she's then interpreted in a religious fashion. Uh, all I can say about that is 
she's tur- if, if, if this is true, that she's having migraines, that she's turned them into a positive thing. Um, that we don't know if anyone else, uh, you know, having migraines has made them into um, a work of theology, in a sense, uh, a visionary theology, perhaps. Uh, and, of course, we also have uh, the illustrations, uh, which are, as we say, quite unique. Now, some of the characteristics of migraines that Kavanagh talks about is uh, the visual field deficit, uh, which is that you see an expanding either black or a blindingly bright hole that you know expands. Uh, she also talks about jagged edges that shimmer with points of light. Uh, and the, even the colors that are used in skivias, blacks, gold, silver, iron, steel gray, uh, are colors that are described as uh, the colors of auras in migraines. Some of the things that are shown in the illustrations are not always in the text. Yeah, they're very unique. And she also talks about the use of light dots around the contours of some of the forms to make the contours seem to shimmer. Uh, the stars are shown very irregularly, which she says are like the shimmering spots in a migraine that seem to move. Uh, there's also something that's called fortification spectra, which she thinks she has interpreted as architectural shapes. And, of course, we mentioned these, these jagged edged forms. Now, I want to say again, even if Hildegard's visions are predicated by a physiological cause, whether the migraine headaches are the impetus for them, their significance become, is in the transformation of what is a debilitating illness into a spiritual experience and message. So I'm going to just show you a few of the uh, pictures. This is one that um, has been cited as uh, showing some of the characteristics of migraines. Um, these jagged edge forms, you see these uh, kind of unique stars. Uh, and you have them both in black and in gold. Uh, this is the fall of Lucifer, the fallen angel, but he's shown as a star, and that the uh, the golden stars, essentially the angels, are falling, and they then are burnt into blackness. You know, they transform from angels of gold of light uh, into, of course, the devils. Uh, the gold and silver colors seem to sparkle. And God has preserved uh, the light of the stars. That's a, you know, Lucifer doesn't take it with them. It's it's a you know we don't see anything else like this in in the history of art. Uh, certainly not in medieval art. Uh, it's a very unique and unusual take on a traditional concept. Uh, this I thought was very interesting as far as particularly the composition. <laughs> um, it's supposed to be the six days of creation. And you see concentric circles that may be seen as the living fire of God the Creator. Uh, and then you have these six small circles. You can see those about in the center, sort of in, in uh, two uh, vertical lines. And they show little tiny images of the six days of creation. And then you have but the face of man emerging out of red clay. So very unusual composition. You have all these, I would say, very interesting uh, negative shapes as well as some of the, the positive shapes and incredibly unconventional iconography. You know, she's using geometric forms. Uh, she's also using these images of the stars, uh, you know, angelic forms. Uh, it's uh, fascinating. This one is the journey to God, which is what the mystic uh, is trying to do. You know, is trying to um, 
what commune with or God is communing with them. Um, and the figure is a personification of the soul uh, who is threatened by devils and she looks up and uh, sees the hand of God reaching down. As a, that's a very traditional image. The hand of God reaching down from the clouds. It goes clear back to early Christian times. It goes through Carolingian art. Uh, you know, it's a, as I say, it's a very traditional image. Uh, but the personification of the soul, and you can see the soul is here threatened by the devil who's going to try to shoot her throw of arrows, um, but she's looking to the hand of God for her strength. And this is perhaps more conventional. Um, you have the crucifixion with Christ on the cross. And you have a personification here of the church. And you can see she's crowned and she's in gold. Uh, the church as the bride of Christ collecting the blood in a chalice, which of course gives it a Eucharistic concept. And the, uh, almost got two levels, the uh, cross reaches down in a sense, visually anyway. Uh, from the cross there are what, uh, vertical shapes, are they streams of light, are the end of the cross? Uh, you'll remember that in the Mass, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross is reenacted in a bloodless fashion and makes merits for the souls of human beings. So this tie-in, of course, between the Mass, when we see the altar below, uh, and the crucifixion, you know, is, is just we are very clearly shown here. That's uh, not unusual, perhaps. Um, and then you have these little, uh, what, little scenes of the resurrection. The second art patron, uh, who is also the author of her book, uh, is known either as Herard of Landsberg or Herard of Hohenberg. Uh, she lives from about 1130 uh, to 1195, and she is the abbess of the Hohenberg, Hohenberg convent in Alsace. And I probably should uh, explain why uh, Alsace today, of course, is in France. So why are we calling her a German uh, artist or author um, because at the, this time uh, Alsace, the, which is now what, eastern France, was German territory. In fact, the names of many of, uh, many of the cities you know, reflect this uh, German names. Um, during the Thirty Years' War, in the 17th century, which is, as you can see, is centuries in the future, uh, at the, the time of, uh, of Herard, uh, this territory was lost uh, to France, uh, and there have been considerable times when it's uh, you know, been taken back and restored, but right now it's French, uh, but in Herard's day it was German. Now, her book, is known as the Hortus Deli Chiarum, or the Garden of Delights. And it was written around 1180. It is a compendium of sacred and historical texts, uh, many of which have been copied out uh, and arranged and chosen uh, by Herard, the abbess of the convent at Hohenberg. And it was, I would say, I'm gonna say undoubtedly, uh, illustrated by nuns in her scriptorium, in the scriptorium at the uh, convent. Now, it was copied in the 19th century. And they were copied in color uh, and then there were line engravings published in 1879 to 99, and there's this great volume um, of the line engravings, and then uh, there's, uh, we'll see one picture that was actually 
uh, also colored in, uh, that they published one colored picture from it, but most of it is just the line engravings. Uh, and that is where I have, uh, I, I purchased that actually when I was working on my women artist course, uh, or purchased a, a copy of it, a facsimile of it. Uh, so when you see the black and white illustrations, which you will, that's where they come from. This manuscript was destroyed uh, during the bombardment of Strasbourg in 1870. So all we have left are the copies and the engravings. And uh, this is a little detail, we'll see the whole image later with uh, uh, what is uh, a portrait, not in the normal, not in the modern sense, a portrait where, oh, you can recognize the person, but a, a, a figure that uh, represents Herard. Oh, we see her standing there. Now, the dedication is quite interesting. I make it known to your holiness that, like a little bee, inspired by God, incidentally, you know, women uh, and, and men uh, always had to get their, their books approved by the church hierarchy. So she's dedicating it here. I make it known to your holiness that, like a little bee inspired by God, I collected from the various flowers of sacred scripture and the philosophic writings this book, which is called The Garden of Delights. And I brought it together to the praise and honor of Christ and the church and for the sake of your love as if into a single sweet honeycomb. So, uh, sort of a lovely metaphor here of the bee collecting and uh, making sweet honey out of it. Um, the book, and it is a compendium, you know, she's not making these up you know, from scratch, uh, but it does illustrate a high level of theological knowledge. Uh, she has not only scripture, uh, but she has theologians right up to 12th century theologians to her own day. Uh, it is written in Latin, but it has German glosses. And what is a gloss? Um, a gloss is uh, when you write notes uh, in the margin or sometimes over the text. Um, it's, it's a comment. It's a commentary. So the book is written in Latin, as, as books were at that day, uh, but they've used the vernacular language to um, make comments, maybe to explain passages. And it, the most likely use of this would be for use at the convent, for the teaching of the nuns, for their study, uh, and for meditation. It also includes poetry and some hymns. Uh, some even have some musical notation, which was... Um, very new at this time. It is large. Uh, it has over 334 illustrations uh, with 130 uh, full page color illustrations. And this is one that is in color. Uh, this is the woman clothed in the sun. Now, this is a very, uh, this, just the subject of the woman clothed in the sun, or also known as the apocalyptic woman, uh, is a very uh, familiar image throughout the history of art from the Middle Ages, uh, clear up until the 20th century. And it's based on the last book of the Christian Bible, the Book of Revelations, or the Apocalypse, uh, in chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. And um, the apocalyptic woman uh, was long identified as the Virgin Mary. And uh, in the Bible, uh, it says that there is uh, this woman who is clothed with the sun, and you see here what they use is this round golden circle behind her to indicate uh, the sun, uh, with the crescent moon at her feet, and you see that here, with stars in her crown. And so she has a crown. Uh, and she gives birth to a child. So this is associated with the Virgin Mary giving birth to the Christ child. But she is threatened by, we see here the beast from the sea is shown uh, on the 
lower left, it's little wavy lines indicating the sea, uh, who is uh, the beast who is you know, fooling all these people into uh, what, worshiping the devil. Uh, that's for the next chapter, uh, Revelation 13. But in the lower right, we see the seven-headed dragon whose tail sweeps the stars from the sky. And the seven-headed dragon uh, tries to drown the woman. He pours out water from his mouth. But the woman is given the wings of an eagle so that she can fly away and escape. And I should have said before that, uh, an angel comes down from heaven and takes the child. So it's not something you saw yesterday on campus or just in your daily life. It's, you could say it's, it's phantasmagorical. It's a visionary. But it's also very visual. <coughs> now, I'm going to show you one that I thought was really unusual. I, I, I've never seen an illustration like this before. Um, it's... It's based on uh, Job forty-two verse one. Can you pull in the Le can you pull in the Leviathan with a ho fish hook, or tie down his rope his or that? Can you pull in the Leviathan with a fish hook, or tie down his tongue with a rope? And so, this is made into an allegory. The Leviathan, or the sea monster, the sea creature, uh, here becomes a symbol for the devil, caught on the hook of the cross. In other words, um, and, and frankly, uh, what St. Augustine talks about uh, you know, the devil being caught uh, by the incarnation. Uh, so it's a, a trap for the devil. You know, he doesn't realize that this is God. Uh, and, of course, uh, we see a little figure that looks like Christ, or God, uh, with a, a fishing rod. <laughs> and, uh, what, all of these little heads. Now, I'm not sure. Are they supposed to be prophets or apostles? And then down at the bottom, you have a, sort of a Christ on the cross as the hook, which you can see, goes out and is, is capturing Leviathan. So it's a kind of allegory showing how the incarnation of Christ tricked Satan and led, in a sense, to his destruction. You know, he thought he would have all human beings in hell because they weren't good enough to, uh, uh, according to Christian doctrine, they were not good enough to uh, save themselves. Uh, but then God sends Christ to be uh, a sacrifice that atones for everyone's sins. And... He's clothed as a human being. You know, he's in the flesh of man. Uh, so uh, this uh, completely fools Satan. And it's, as I said, I, I've never seen anything like this. It's a really interesting image. Uh, here's another image which is uh, perhaps a little more traditional. We do see other images of the mystic wine press. Uh, and here you can see uh, Christ in the center treading on the grapes. And uh, he's actually in the press. Uh, the wine press, in other words, uh, where you're pressing the grapes to make wine and squeezing them, and squeezing the juices out, uh, becomes a symbol for the cross of Christ, or sometimes for the church. The grapes are symbolically uh, Christ's blood, which is shed on the cross, and also refers to the wine of the mass, which is according to Christian doctrine, according to Catholic doctrine, uh, by transubstantiation is, becomes the blood of Christ. So Christ being shown in the wine press symbolizes his own sacrificial death, shedding his blood for mankind. And um, these are the notes that I, I found from the you know, the facsimile I have of the, the 19th century publication, it says that a text on the beam of the press read, 
Christ trod the winepress alone so that all could be saved. I tread the winepress alone. The winepress is the holy cross. And according to this publication, it said that this is the oldest representation of the subject, um, at least certainly that, that has survived. It's, of course, not surviving now, but uh, that you know, survived to modern times so that we knew of it. So even though this becomes a traditional image, it once again is a very interesting image. Um, and this is the last image uh, in the uh, Garden of Delights here. Uh, and it shows the congregation of the nuns at the convent of Hohenberg. And you have this little bust figures of the nuns, uh, each labeled with her name. And there's a variety in them. Now, granted, I, I doubt that they you know, resemble closely uh, the nuns because we don't um, we don't have a tradition of you know, likeness at this time. So these it represent them, and the fact that they have the little uh, labels on this tells us you know who they are essentially. And then the abbess herself is standing there, you know, holding this uh, long uh, inscription, uh, like it was a scroll. So here we see I just a little detail so you can see better. Uh, you know, there is some variation between each nun. Uh, each of their names. And, uh, you know, there's some, some slight variations that may or may not reflect what the women uh, actually look like. But, you know, don't expect likeness in portraiture in the 12th century. It's much too early. And here we have Abbas Harard, uh, the full-length figure, and her banner could translate as Oh, you white flowers, pure as snow. And, you know, she's talking about the nuns. Uh, who spread the perfume of your virtues and who, scorning earthly dust, rest in the contemplation of divine things. May your course be ever directed toward heaven where you will be face to face with the betrothed at the moment still hidden from your view. So this is directed to the nuns, whom she calls white flowers, pure as the snow, talks about the perfume of their virtues. The betrothed, of course, is Christ. Um, nuns are believed to be brides of Christ, uh, rather than brides of earthly men. 